Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here today to speak with you. Um, it's kind of odd. As a computer scientist, I want to tell you about the fact that the world actually needs more wizards and witches, which is kind of an odd thing. It's not telling you that just because I'm a Harry Potter fan, although I am, and I imagine some of you might be as well. But it's actually due to the fact, if we go forward, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Okay? And by that token, you all, in some sense, have the opportunity to do magic. It's just a matter of whether or not you get the training for it, whether or not you're prepared for it, whether or not you're ready to face the challenges of the world with computing as a tool that you have available to you. And so when Arthur C. Clarke, who's a science fiction writer, wrote 2001, among other kinds of books, said this, that was the idea, was if you think about culture, if you think about the place technology has in culture, whenever technologies get far enough along where we don't understand what that technology is doing anymore, it just gets chalked up to something that's magical. And the problem with that is if you don't understand what technology is actually doing, you also don't understand what it's capable of doing. So to give you some thoughts, here's a little notion of a new idea for a camera, which was developed at Stanford a couple years ago. The idea is what if you could take one picture and just refocus it wherever you wanted. So it wasn't a matter of taking a movie or having any kind of special um, uh, video editing equipment, you just had a camera, you took a picture, and after the fact you could focus it. Even horribly focused pictures, you could refocus them. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is you could, for example, have translucent materials like water that you could also focus through. Or if you had some picture and you decided there were some people in it that maybe you wanted to blur out, you could do that as well. <laughs> so there's lots of interesting things that you can actually do with this kind of technology. There's other kinds of technology that have been developed in the last few years which are also interesting. Here's a car, it's an autonomous vehicle known as Junior, and by autonomous that means it drives itself. And the interesting thing about this car that was developed in a lab at Stanford a few years back is Sebastian Thrun, the professor who was leading this project, said that in 50 to 60 years it's a no-brainer that cars will be driving themselves. He was quoted as saying that roughly a year ago. And to give you a, an idea as to what this car is actually capable of doing, here is that car in action. This is something that was a challenge that was run a few years back called the DARPA Urban Grand Challenge. And the idea was, could you have a car autonomously, that's by itself, be able to drive around in an urban environment, be able to recognize things like intersections and stop at them, understand the rules of the road and be able to reason about them so that when it got to a stop sign and it realized that there were other cars there, it had to recognize the cars. It had to realize that it did not have the right of way. It had to wait for those other cars to successfully move out, move out of the way and recognize that they'd moved out of the way. And only then, when it was its turn and it was safe for it to move, would it then successfully navigate through the intersection. Doing all this without a human being at the wheel. And the idea is what's really going on inside this machine. This is a software problem. There's a bunch of computers inside that machine that this is, in some sense, what they see in the world. Red are markings that represent things that are barriers or blocks, and knowing that certain combinations of them actually make for a car because it's on the road and that it can move and that it actually is at a stop sign and it has the right of way. These are all things that are realized in software. And when we think about what software is capable of doing, that it can in fact be built to reason about situations in the world, recognize artifacts in the world, take various kinds of actions, it makes for some pretty compelling ideas that we might explore in the future. And if you think this stuff is really just science fiction, consider this. Two weeks ago, the state of Nevada actually became the first state to pass legislation to allow autonomous cars on the road legally. So in fact, these cars can drive around the state of Nevada by themselves as of two weeks ago. And so we're thinking of this happening in the next 50 to 60 years, certainly within your lifetime, is not a huge stretch. One of the other things to also consider is, if we think about something like this, there are some people who are the detractors. And when you actually take a look at this article in USA Today, some of the commentary on it's also pretty interesting. <laughs> Note to self, don't visit Nevada. At least until the technology gets a little bit more perfected. But the idea behind this, if you think of a self-driving car, at one level you could think, oh, well, that's interesting. Now I could get in a car and it could drive me somewhere while I'm reading a book or something like that. Well, what Sebastian actually thinks about is the fact that every year about 1.2 million people are killed in car accidents. And he believes that this technology can cut that number in half. If you could save 600,000 lives a year through technology, it's pretty compelling technology. 
Now, when I think about all these things, I think about technology as being a growth accelerant and computing being at the heart of that. And if you think about the way in which computing is actually accelerating this growth, I'll give you a little example. Here's a picture of Google 15 years ago. This is a room in the Gates building at the computer science department at Stanford. And if you notice something up here at near the top that looks like it's made out of Legos, that's because in fact it is made out of Legos. <laughs> they ran out of server bays in the computers that they had to house all the hard drives that they needed to store the data on the web. So Larry Page went off, got some Legos, put them together in a little casing, put some fans in there, hard drives, voila, more of the web. Okay? <laughs> this was 15 years ago. And if you take a look at what Google looked like 15 years ago, its interface looked like this, which is also a testament to the fact that graduate students in computer science probably should not do graphic design. But that's not important right now. What is important is the fact that if you look kind of closely at the middle of the page, it says the index contains approximately 25 million pages, soon to be much bigger. That was back in 1997. If you take this idea and fast forward 10 years to 2007, which was around the last time that Google publicly put out figures as to how large its web index was, at that time its web index was roughly 20 billion web pages. It had grown in 10 years by three orders of magnitude. It had gotten a thousand times bigger. Think about your life. What has happened that's accelerated by a factor of a thousand in 10 years? Cars and planes didn't get a thousand times faster. We don't produce a thousand times more energy than we did before. But in that 10 year span, computing made a thousand times more information available at your fingertips. That's the kind of acceleration and opportunity we're talking about. Here's another question for you. What's a defining characteristic of China and India? Any idea? Population. Population. As a matter of fact, one of the defining characteristics of them is they're the only two countries left on the planet with a population greater than that of Facebook. <laughs> For now, okay? That's happened in an eight year period. So the rate at which technology is accelerating and having an impact on our lives, what we do, what we see, what we understand, the social interactions that we have has a huge impact on the entire planet. Now, when you think about that impact, you think about opportunity and you think about, well, this should be a wonderful thing. And in some sense it is. There's only one problem. The thing that's driving this innovation, that's allowing for all these kind of technological breakthroughs to happen, is actually shrinking, interestingly enough. What do you think that could be? It's you, okay? Why is it you? It's not that you're getting smaller in size. It's that the number of people who choose to take on the challenges of computing is getting smaller. Let me show you as an educator in computer science the thing I worry about. The thing I worry about is encapsulated in this little graph. This is the average number of computer science majors at computer science departments in United States universities. And you can see back in 1999, 2000, everyone and their dog wanted to be a computer science major. We were partying like it was 1999, partly because it was pretty close to 1999. But the number of computer science majors was high. Things seemed happy, it seemed like we had a lot of driving force for this growth. And then in a five year period from 2000 basically to around 2005, 2006, the number of people studying this discipline dropped by 50% nationally. The number dropped in half. Okay? So that's what was going on by 2006. Not so much excitement. And recently we've seen a little bit of increase, but we're nowhere near where we were before. People look at this data and they say, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, certainly in Silicon Valley, we must have been immune to that, right? Stanford University is known for its computer science department. Well, what was going on over there? Here's what was going on over there. Exactly the same thing. There was no immunity because we were in Silicon Valley. There was a peak around 2000, 2001, dropped by 50% by 2006. Okay? And so the question is, why? Why did this happen and how can we think about changing it? So when I stared at this graph over here long enough, this graph over here long enough, if it ever shows up, I thought about a different graph. Let me show you the different graph. This is the NASDAQ Composite Index, okay, which is a technology index, an index of technology stocks. And if you look at it around 2000, it peaks and it drops precipitously after that. And so you look at this graph, you look at the other graph and say, wow, those look really similar. Yeah, they do. Let's put them on top of each other. Okay? So if we take these two graphs and we put them on top of each other, this is what we get. Now, the interesting thing is students are not a marketplace like the stock market. It's not like stocks go up and I decide to change my major and stocks go down. No, I'm not going to do computer science anymore. 
it takes some time for decisions to get made. And for that time to occur, what I do is I said, let's say it's about nine months for sort of economic indicators to get into student psyches as to what they should do and change their decision making. So I took the academic year and shifted it by nine months to align it with the calendar year, normalize the graphs, and this is what I got. They peak in exactly the same place. Throughout a 15 year period or 10 year period from 1999 to 2001, they were extremely strongly correlated. And so, if you think about that graph a little bit, one of the things that happens is there's a correlation over the whole period, but one of the things that jumps out at you is something happened in 2003, right? All this stuff was tracking until that point, and then it starts to diverge. What happened in 2003 that would cause this divergence? So we dig a little bit deeper, and one of the things we find is it's this time you start hearing all these press stories about offshoring. Yeah, there's lots of jobs in computing, just none of them are here. And everyone has a cousin's friend who was laid off from their job because the job got offshored somewhere. Well, that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, except it's just not true that there weren't jobs. People didn't have the right perception. They read a bunch of media reports and thought, you know what, the economy could be getting better, but that's not going to impact me, so I'm going to choose not to go into that field. And the problem was that they were wrong. Okay? Here's actually some statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They do do some useful things where they look at over a 10 year period from 2008 projected out to 2018. So certainly by the time you graduate from college. How many jobs are there in a particular field versus the number of bachelor's graduates in that field? In some areas you can see the numbers are pretty close. Physical science, that's like physics, chemistry, mathematics. The number of jobs is almost the same as the number of grads. It's actually slightly less and what that means is the best graduates are the ones getting the jobs. Those fields are cream skimming. Okay? And you can see there are some life sciences and a large number of the gra grads actually go on to medical school, which is not captured in there. What does that look like in computing? It looks like this. <laughs> the number of jobs projected to exist is three times the number of graduates. So guess where those mathematics majors who don't get jobs doing math on a daily basis? How many people do math on a daily basis? Not many. Where do they go? Over here. What about the engineers? Over here. What about physical sciences? Over there. The majority of people who are doing jobs in computing were not trained in computing. And we wonder why our credit card numbers get stolen when we make online transactions. Because the people who built those systems didn't necessarily learn about security in the programs that they took as undergraduates. Okay? So in some sense, What's going on is there's a misperception of those bars over there that pushes students away from thinking about computer science as a discipline to go into. And so when we think about college computing curriculum, what we need to do is think about creating a larger awareness of what computer science is and thinking about the fact that computer science isn't just about doing one thing, building software, but it's increasingly used in other fields. Thinking about biology, thinking about the future of medicine, thinking about cars on the road. These are all places where computing will have a big impact, whether or not someone chooses to major in computer science or be a computer scientist, but at least have some understanding of what's possible to do with technology. And so what we need to think about is providing context. Most people, when they think of computer science, they say, oh, that's programming. Those are my friends who spend all their nights like staying up drinking Diet Coke and eating Doritos and programming. Or I'm going to stay in a cube 80 hours a week and program. I don't want that life. Well, that's not what being a computer scientist is. Programming is a, me it's a means to doing something. It allows you to do something. It's not the end in itself. There's people who are using computing as a way to try to think of cancer as a computational problem to solve. That's something where programming is not the end. The end is eradicating cancer. And so if we can get students to understand that, more of them will think about computing as sort of the substrate on which they can build their careers. It's about empowerment. That's what computing really gives you. So what we did at Stanford is we said we need to get this idea out. Let's put in a new curriculum. So in 2008, 2009, a couple years ago, we put in a new computer science curriculum. It went into effect. And the next two years, we saw this. The number of computer science majors nearly doubled. And the point of that curriculum was just to show students the power of computing, what you could do with computer science, which wasn't just programming. Now we want to take that idea and expand it a little bit further. And in fact, there's a global initiative called CS 2013. And the idea behind this initiative is of every 10 years, the major professional societies in computing put out a set of guidelines that's sort of international in scope in terms of what computer science education should be, what should colleges strive for when they try to get students to learn about computing. 
and the next full volume is set for 2013, which is why it's called CS 2013. And that volume is being heavily influenced by this kind of work. The kind of work to say computing is something that's really for everyone. And it's not just about the majors, it's not just about the people who want to sit in a cube 80 hours a week, but it's everyone knowing something about computing to be able to tackle the challenges of our time. It's the big tent of computer science. No matter what you do, computing is going to impact it in some way, and you need to understand what computing is about to really know how it's going to be impacted. So the story continues. In the last couple of years, we saw that big growth, and then the year after, we saw this happen, and we got really worried. because so We thought, what's going on? We got this huge surge in the number of majors, and suddenly the numbers are starting to drop again. Should we be worried? And so we held our breath. We held our breath, and then this year we saw the numbers, and it looked like this. What had happened was, it wasn't that students had lost interest in computing, it's that they were lazy and they didn't declare until the following year. Okay? Yeah, sometimes Stanford gives you a little flexibility as to when you actually need to say what your major is. But at this point, there's more people studying computer science than ever at Stanford. And that's a na becoming a national phenomenon, which is nice to see. Now, I'll leave you with a couple final thoughts. The final thoughts are, at the beginning when we talked about the NASDAQ Composite Index and interest in computational fluency, I said, you know, there's this correlation, and as the NASDAQ went up, more students chose to major in computer science. So clearly, the health of the high-tech economy was a driver for students' interest in computational fluency to learn something about computing. But if you think about that long term, if you think about that graph, not over a three-year period or a four-year period, but over a 20 or 30-year period, it's not just in one direction. If we don't get enough people interested and facile in computing, the level of interest in computational fluency will drive what our economy looks like 20 years from now. And so what's really going on here is the notion that progress is not a given. Okay? Don't think of progress as something where it's like, oh, someone else is going to do that. Right? There's no guarantee they will. It's not something that gets relegated for someone else to do. It's not guaranteed to happen. The only reason why progress happens and that we can actually face the challenges of our time is because people choose to learn about hard things so they can solve hard problems. And I'll leave you with one final quote from sort of a personal hero of mine, Mahatma Gandhi, who basically said, if you want to change the world, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you. <laughs>